Hello and welcome, I'm Fernando, a GP in the UK. Today, we're going to go through the management of hypocalcemia. In particular, we will look at the guidance on the management of hypocalcemia in NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde and in Liverpool University Hospital's NHS Trust, always focusing on what is relevant in primary care only. The links to their guidelines and the other sources consulted are in the episode description. Right, without further ado, let's jump into it. As a quick overview of calcium metabolism, I will simply say that it is tightly regulated by vitamin D and the parathyroid hormone, or PTH. Active vitamin D, or calcitriol, enhances intestinal calcium absorption, and PTH both enhances calcium reabsorption in the kidneys and releases calcium from the bones by increasing osteoclast activity and bone resorption. Both phosphate and magnesium can affect calcium levels. For example, a low magnesium can impair PTH secretion and action, resulting in hypercalcemia. On the other hand, a high phosphate, like seen in CKD, can lead to the precipitation of calcium with phosphate and the consequent reduction in serum calcium and hypercalcemia. Right, now that we have done this review, let's look at hypercalcemia itself. The reference range for adjusted serum calcium is 2.2 to 2.6. Symptoms of hypercalcemia typically develop when serum adjusted calcium falls below 1.9. However, this threshold varies and symptoms also depend on the rate of fall. So, we will talk of hypercalcemia when we have an adjusted serum calcium less than 2.2. Although you should always take into account your local path lab reference range. The cause of hypercalcemia may be varied depending on whether we are talking about acute or chronic hypercalcemia. And we must remember that hypercalcemia is far less common than hypercalcemia because of the role of the bones as calcium reserve to maintain homeostasis. So let's look at the causes of acute hypercalcemia first. The most common cause is hyperventilation which induces transient hypercalcemia with normal serum total calcium levels. Let's quickly see why this is the case. When a person hyperventilates, they breathe out excessive CO2, which leads to a decrease of carbonic acid and respiratory alkalosis. Alkalosis causes more calcium to bind to albumin, reducing the concentration of free ionized calcium. Given that the ionized form is the physiologically active form, this decrease leads to symptoms of hypercalcemia. However, despite the decrease in ionized free calcium, the total serum calcium remains normal because this value includes the calcium bowel to albumin 2. Other less common causes are other forms of alkalosis, medications, for example, post IV bisphosphonate or denosumab treatment, a high phosphate. We have to remember that phosphate and calcium often behave like two parts of a seesaw, where changes in one can inversely affect the other. Therefore, hypercalcemia can be seen in clinical situations where phosphate is high, like in rapid tumor lysis, like for example during cytotoxic treatment of leukemia, or in excessive phosphate intake, like for example excessive phosphate containing enemas. And finally, another less common cause of hypercalcemia is acute pancreatitis. Let's now look at the causes of chronic hypercalcemia. And the most common cause is a decrease in levels of active vitamin D. This could be because there is an overall vitamin D deficiency, like in dietary causes, malabsorption and lack of sunlight, or a reduction in the active form of vitamin D or calcitriol, due to poor renal conversion, as seen in CKD. Less common causes are hypoparathyroidism, which can be post-surgical, autoimmune, genetic, idiopathic, etc. Hypomagnesemia, because low magnesium impairs the secretion and function of PTH, giving rise to a functional hypoparathyroidism. Another cause is pseudo-hypoparathyroidism, which is a rare genetic disorder characterized by the body's resistance to PTH despite normal or elevated PTH levels. And finally, 
low plasma albumin caused by, for example, malnutrition or liver disease. However, it is worth mentioning that a low plasma albumin can lead to low total calcium levels, but it does not cause true hypocalcemia, understood as low ionized to free calcium. Instead, it leads to pseudo-hypocalcemia, where only the bound calcium is reduced. So typically, patients do not experience symptoms of low calcium unless the ionized calcium is also low. It is also worth mentioning that dietary lack of calcium intake is a very rare cause of hypercalcemia. What are the symptoms and signs of hypercalcemia? Well, the clinical features of hypercalcemia are connected to its effect on the nerves and muscles. Typical features include effects on the nervous system, like, for example, paresthesia, convulsions, which may occur because hypercalcemia lowers the seizure threshold, and psychiatric effects from general malaise to overt psychosis in chronic hypercalcemia. Effects on the muscles like painful cramps, tetany, which may result in spontaneous muscular spasms, largely precipitated by exercise, laryngeal spasms causing stridor and obstructive respiratory symptoms, and latent tetany, which may be demonstrated by Trousseau's and Schwarzsteg's signs. Let's quickly have a look at them. For Trousseau's sign, a blood pressure cuff is inflated, usually about 20 mm of mercury above the systolic blood pressure, and it is left inflated for about 3 minutes. A positive sign is indicated by involuntary contraction of the muscles in the hand and fingers known as carpal spasm or trussus phenomenon. On the other hand, Schwarzsteg's sign is performed by tapping on the facial nerve just in front of the ear at the angle of the jaw, which is the area where the facial nerve crosses the masseter muscle. A positive sign is indicated by twitching of the facial muscles on the same side. Both trussus and Schwarzsteg signs are indicative of increased neuromuscular excitability which is often associated with hypercalcemia, although not exclusively. Other features of chronic hypercalcemia depend on the underlying cause. They can be very varied, so I will mention only a few, like candidiasis, nail dystrophy, alopecia, and rickets or stimulation from chronic vitamin D deficiency. What investigations should be carried out in primary care if we find hypercalcemia? And we are obviously talking about mild asymptomatic hypercalcemia because patients with severe or symptomatic hypercalcemia should be referred to hospital. Initial investigations should include, as a minimum, a repeat serum adjusted calcium and phosphate, parathyroid hormone, urea and electrolytes, magnesium, vitamin D, and a 12 lead ECG, as there is significant likelihood of QT prolongation, in which case cardiac monitoring may be required. We should monitor calcium concentrations regularly to judge response and review treatment. Serum bone profile should be checked regularly according to clinical judgment. Perhaps weekly or fortnightly depending on the case until concentrations are stable. Let's now have a look at the treatment of hypercalcemia. The treatment depends on the severity of symptoms and underlying condition. Treatment generally involves administration of calcium, how calcium is administered and the need for additional agents such as vitamin D depends on the acuity and severity of the hypercalcemia, as well as the underlying cause. Severe hypercalcemia, that is, a serum-adjusted calcium less than 1.9, and or symptomatic hypercalcemia, should be treated as a medical emergency because it can be life-threatening. So, this patient should be referred to hospital for the administration of IV calcium. Chronic asymptomatic mild hypercalcemia, that is, serum adjusted calcium between 1.9 and 2.2, is treated with oral calcium and often vitamin D supplements. Because calcium binds with dietary phosphate and oxalate, we should advise patients that calcium is better absorbed when taken between meals. Oral calcium is given to increase its availability and often vitamin D to enhance absorption. 
Calcium carbonate is widely available in tablet form and we should aim for a daily dose of 1 to 2.6 grams and then adjust according to response. Examples of calcium carbonate supplements are Adcal and Calcitril. NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde recommends starting Calcitril 40 chewable, two tablets twice a day, which is an unlicensed dose and adjust the dose according to the patient's requirement. As soon as it is appropriate, we should prescribe the licensed dose of one tablet daily. Alternatively, Liverpool University hospitals recommend starting oral calcium and vitamin D supplements such as Adcal D3, two to four tablets daily, with monitoring and adjustment. Calcium citrate and calcium phosphate should be avoided because they may cause problems, especially in patients with renal failure. If a patient is vitamin D deficient, we will start oral vitamin D supplementation with loading doses of cholecalciferol, as per the NICE guideline on vitamin D deficiency. Vitamin D2 or ergocalciferol and vitamin D3 or cholecalciferol at doses of 400 units a day are adequate to avoid nutritional deficiency, although higher doses may be needed in malabsorption. However, they require conversion to the active form calcitriol and therefore they are not suitable if the alpha hydroxylation process is impaired like for example in renal failure. In these cases, we should be guided by the renal team. Other general principles that apply to the management of hypercalcemia are Magnesium levels should be checked and corrected if low. If a patient has hypomagnesemia, we should stop any precipitating drug and admit the patient to hospital for the administration of IV magnesium. Patients on digoxy should be monitored carefully because administration of calcium may lead to digoxin toxicity and death. Patients with hypoparathyroidism have decreased renal calcium reabsorption and oral calcium supplements may lead to hypercalciuria with possible nephrocalcinosis or kidney stones. Therefore, in hypoparathyroidism, the treatment should be guided by endocrinology. If hypercalcemia is secondary to post-thyroidectomy, we will also seek specialist advice. When calcium is given to patients with hyperphosphatemia, there is a risk of soft tissue calcium phosphate precipitation, so we should get specialist advice on the use of phosphate binders. In fact, calcium supplements may have to be delayed until phosphate levels come down. Right, so that is it. We have come to the end of this episode. Remember that this is not medical advice, and it is only my summary and my interpretation of the guidelines. You must always use your clinical judgment. Thank you for watching and goodbye.